Better get this fuel tank topped up. My oxygen supply is running low upstairs. Gotta get out of here soon. Better answer that call first. What's happening up there? Stella, we need your help. We're having an argument about energy. Yeah, Hayley reckons her plant's using energy. But look it, it's not doing anything. It can't run, it can't jump. And I'd like to see it lifting weights. It doesn't move at all. Of course it doesn't move. But plants still use a lot of energy to grow. But plants don't use much energy. That's why they don't need to eat. They just use the light energy they get from the sun, don't they? I'm not sure about that. Plants may not use energy in the way we normally think of. They do look pretty inactive. But there's more to plants than meets the eye, as Femi's about to find out. I think I found a plant that's pretty active. Now, I thought it'd be a good idea to have green fingers for this investigation, but... What on earth is everybody doing? Hang on a minute, everybody, hold on. I've come to find out whether plants use much energy, but, Sean, everybody's cutting all the plants down. What's going on? Well, we've got to control the plant because we've got a problem with it throughout the country, especially here in Swansea. What is the problem? It's called Japanese knotweed, and we're fighting a pitch battle against it because it's taken over lots and lots of land. Oh, better carry on. Hang on a minute. It's um, a bit of an unfair battle, isn't it? What has this plant ever done to you? We can't really fight the knotweed around here. There's even a law stopping people from planting it, which keeps spreading and spreading. It tries to get everywhere. There's no stopping it. Mrs Lyons over there even has it thrown out of her floor, and her floor's made of concrete. Japanese knotweed's an amazing plant. It grows quickly and powerfully. It uses a lot of energy. In fact, it can break through concrete and knock over walls. At its fastest, it grows 30 centimetres a day. Kaisalam cemeteries are lost beneath knotweed, so the local scouts and girls' school have offered to clear it. Well, Sean, it's not going to be that difficult a battle, is it? Because you just chop it down and that gets rid of the problem. Well, sadly, it's not quite that simple, because even a piece of rhizome or root or a shoot a couple of centimetres long left in the ground will grow back in a couple of years and completely co cover the graveyard. All we can do for now is chop and clear this year's growth. Next year, it will need to be chemically sprayed to stop it growing back. But clearing is tiring work. I don't think I'm the only one running out of energy and there's huge amounts of nutweed left to clear. Hi, Steve. Hi, Femi. Are we losing the battle? Is there any way of telling? I've got some equipment here that we can use to measure how much energy the knotweed is actually using. So we can compare the energy used by the plant to the amount of energy that we're using in trying to cut it down. We keep battling. Meanwhile, Steve takes some measurements. What will his tests find? Just how much energy is this plant using? So, what have you found out, then? Well, I think I've got a surprise for you. He sure did. Steve's calculated that in one day, an area of knotweed, three metres by three metres, uses the same amount of energy as a person clearing it up. Well, all this hard work certainly gives you an appetite. Jacket potatoes, there you go. Mm, I needed this with Star, but it feels like I can get my energy back. So, Chris, how's it been going since I left to collect lunch? We're winning, but there's a long way to go. 
We've had to eat an awful lot of food to get enough energy to clear this knotweed. What an energetic plant it is. That knotweed is amazing. But it's not the only plant that uses energy. In fact, all living things need energy. Look at these cells seen through a microscope. They need energy to grow and divide. It's the same for every single cell of every living thing, animal or plant. The process that releases this energy from food is called respiration. Animals eat their food. Plants don't eat. They make their own food in photosynthesis. Photosynthesis for green plants, eating for animals. Different methods, but both providing carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, like flour, are an energy store. Burning flour can release the stored energy. This pipe will give a quick burst of air so that it's all heated evenly at once over the flame. Let's see. Ready? Wow! The energy is released as heat, light and sound. Wow! An explosion! That's impressive. Imagine if food exploded like that inside you. It'd kill you. Yeah. But Stella, if food doesn't burn up inside you, how does the energy in food get released? Fortunately, respiration releases energy in a much more controlled way. This experiment shows how plants release energy in respiration as heat. In this container is well-soaked germinating wheat. The other container is a control. It contains the same amount of water, but is full of dead wheat. Look at the thermometers. The live wheat is a lot warmer than the dead wheat. Respiration is slowly releasing energy as heat. My ventilation system down here is starting to fail. I'm going to have to get out of this place soon. Meanwhile, Femi is investigating what else is needed for respiration. This group are about to embark on an expedition with the British Schools Exploring Society. They're on their way to the Himalayas, but not today. Today, they're preparing for an experiment they will be taking part in during their trip. It's to do with respiration. <sighs> Have you ever wondered why you get out of breath when you exercise, even if you're fit? I've got absolutely no energy left. I'm having a rest. Here, take one of these. It'll give you energy. You don't seem to have energy to spare. Mind you, that's no bad thing where you're going. You're going to need a lot of energy soon. Are you thinking about what sort of food you're going to eat on the expedition? Well, we're going to be walking for six hours every day through the mountains. That's for six weeks. That means we're going to need lots of high-energy foods. Like what? We'll be eating foods for those carbohydrates. Things like chapatis, rice, chocolate biscuits. But it's not just food we need to get the energy. We need something else. And what do you mean? Well, we're meeting someone at the top to explain it all. Come on, let's go. I knew they'd run. Ah, oh, you made it then. Hi, David. Hi. Hi, David. Come on through. <laughs> Hi, David. Hi. What took you so long? Is there any? <laughs> Come on through. Do you feel like you used a lot of energy coming up the stairs? Absolutely loads, but nowhere near as much as the expedition are going to be using. Now, we talked about them taking high-energy foods, but where exactly does the energy come from? Well, the energy we need is released by a process called respiration. I thought we got our energy from food. Well, food is an energy store, and carbohydrate is one of the best stores of energy. But it's not enough just to eat the food. We need also to release that energy to take in a gas from the air that we breathe. Air is a mixture of different gases. It's mainly nitrogen and oxygen with a very small amount of carbon dioxide. But which one of these gases do we need? We can test to see what gas our bodies need 
by looking at the difference in the gases that we breathe in mm -hmm. and the gases that we breathe out. As we know that the air around us is 21% of oxygen and only 0.03% of carbon dioxide. And if you'd like to pop the mask on, we'll have a look at the gas that you breathe out. When I breathe out, the air only contains 15% oxygen, not 21% as before. Well, that's a lot less than I inhaled, so I must have used up some of the oxygen when I breathed. That's right. If you'd like to pop the mask back on, we'll have a look at the carbon dioxide that you breathe out. Only 0.03% of the air I breathed in was carbon dioxide, but when I breathe out, that has increased to 5%. That's over 160 times more carbon dioxide than the air you breathed in. That's amazing. And look, if you'd like to take hold of that and breathe out, you'll see another byproduct of the process. Water. So, I used up oxygen and produced carbon dioxide and water. And energy. Respiration is a chemical reaction which releases the energy we need. The carbohydrates in our food react with the oxygen from the air. This produces carbon dioxide, water and most importantly, energy. But what's all this got to do with you and the expedition, Ellie? Well, on the expedition, we're going to be doing a lot of exercise. So we're going to need loads of oxygen to release all the energy we need. But we'll be climbing to over 6,000 metres, and at that sort of altitude, some of us will suffer from altitude sickness. At high altitudes, the air is less dense than at sea level. There is less air to breathe, so you take in less oxygen in each breath. This lack of oxygen makes some people very ill. It's called altitude sickness, and the expedition have volunteered to help find out more about this illness. So, David, how's this going to help you? I'm hoping that the test they'll be doing here and they'll be doing at altitude on the expedition will help us to predict who's going to become ill from altitude sickness. And if we knew that, then we'd be able to give them medicines to help them prevent it. Hmm. That's better. I don't want to get short of oxygen down here. Just like animals, when plants respire, they use oxygen in the air and produce carbon dioxide and water. But in the light, plants photosynthesize too. So to investigate the gas exchange and respiration alone, I'll have to do the next experiment in the dark. No light means no photosynthesis. This cylinder passes pure oxygen down this tubing into a bell gel. There's no carbon dioxide in there at all. Another tube passes the outlet gas through this bicarbonate indicator. Left overnight, if the plant is producing carbon dioxide, the indicator will turn yellow. So, sure enough, just like us, this plant is producing carbon dioxide. So, inside the cells of all living things, animals and plants, a chemical reaction is taking place to unlock the energy in food. So when carbohydrates combine with oxygen, it produces energy, carbon dioxide, and water. And white balls coming up on the inside, but there's only a short hair between big ears and midnight chicken. They're coming into the final ball. Racehorses certainly look as though they're using a lot of energy when they're running a race. But just how much energy do they need? And how can they get it all from just a handful of hay? I know I'd need to eat a lot more than a handful of hay to make me run that fast. I'm with Christine Smy, who knows a lot about what horses need to eat. They need a tremendous amount of energy. We measure energy in kilojoules. Standing here, we'd be using around five kilojoules per minute. And if we were to run a three-minute race, we'd be using 150 kilojoules. And that would be approximately the energy equivalent of this much beef burger. That's not much for beef burger. How much energy, then, would a racehorse need to use? A racehorse running a three-minute race would require 65,000 kilojoules. 
Wow. And in order to gain that much energy, he would have to eat the equivalent of 17 beef burgers. A bucket full of beef burgers. That's a huge amount of energy. But how can Arnie get that much energy from just eating hay? We can use a bomb colorimeter to measure just how much energy is stored in one gram of finely chopped hay. So one gram of hay contains eight kilojoules of energy. So for one race, Arnie would have to eat this much hay. But racehorses can't spend all their time eating. So most are also given food pellets, which are very high in carbohydrates. Watch. If we put one gram of finely chopped food pellets into the bomb colorimeter, we can see just how good an energy source they are. One gram of food pellets provides not eight, but 15 kilojoules of energy. As well as high energy food, horses have another advantage in the energy stakes. They have a very efficient respiratory system. Hello. Hello. Hello, Jeremy. I'll leave you two to it now. At the Equine Sports Centre, Jeremy is able to study just how efficient a horse's respiratory system is. This looks like a major piece of equipment. But why do you ever need to measure a horse's respiration? Well, sometimes horses don't run as well as we know they can. And this equipment is an ideal way of finding out just why. Because in many cases, it's because a horse can't get enough oxygen down to burn the fuels in its muscles. So, Arnie, let's get you kitted up and see how you check out. Using special equipment, Jeremy can measure how much air Arnie breathes in and out. And from this, we can calculate exactly how much oxygen Arnie's using in respiration. And don't worry, Jeremy's not hurting Arnie at all. Standing still, I inhale about seven litres of air every minute, which is enough to fill balloon this size. When Arnie's standing still, he inhales 60 litres of air every minute. When I'm exercising, I need more oxygen. So I inhale about this much air every minute. That's 20 litres. But let's see how much air Arnie inhales when he's jogging. To release the energy Arnie's using, he's certainly inhaling a lot more air than I am standing next to him. In fact, he's inhaling an amazing 2,200 litres of air every minute. Plenty of fresh water for me. And... My gerbil. In the wild, gerbils live in some of the world's driest deserts. How do they survive? Could respiration help them with their need for water? Maybe they use their water, you know, instead of wasting it from their food. Yeah, but Stella said respiration comes into it. Well, in respiration, as well as energy and carbon dioxide, water is released. So maybe gerbils don't waste the water produced in respiration. Maybe they use it instead of drinking. Pretty smart, those gerbils. Wish I could do that. You'd never get thirsty. We need your help. We're having an argument about energy. Yeah, Hayley reckons her plants are using energy. But look it, it's not doing anything. It can't run, it can't jump. And I'd like to see it lifting weights. It doesn't move at all. Of course it doesn't move. But plants still use a lot of energy to grow. But plants don't use much energy. That's why they don't need to eat. They just use the light energy they get from the sun, don't they? I'm not sure about that. Plants may not use energy in the way we normally think of. They do look pretty inactive. But there's more to plants than meets the eye, as Femi's about to find out. I think I...
Gotta get this fuel tank topped up. My oxygen supply is running low upstairs. Gotta get out of here soon. Better answer that call first. What's happening up there? Stella found a plant that's pretty active. Now, I thought it'd be a good idea to have green fingers for this investigation, but what on earth is everybody doing? Hang on a minute, everybody, hold on. I've come to find out whether plants use much energy, but, Sean, everybody's cutting all the plants down. What's going on? Well, we've got to control the plant because 